Hello, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 54 of the Archaeologist Podcast, a show where we discuss everything and anything that has to do with Ark Survival Evolved. I am your host, Sean DeKnight, and with me are a number of players that are here to offer their insights and opinions on the latest topics, strategies, and upcoming features or patches. As I call it our participants for tonight, say hello to the listeners and how many hours you have in Ark. Rico! Uh, still same as the last time, because uh, Ark refuses to properly update without being corrupted. Yeah, mm. you, you seem to get that problem more and more where it either uninstalls itself or it's corrupted and you have to reinstall the entire thing. The forums are actually getting pretty full of that problem, actually. Yeah. And leg day. Hey, I've got uh, 2,821, apparently. <laughs> so it's going up. It's going up. It's, get, it's going. It's going. Now, let's hit up the YouTube comments. Um... We actually missed one of the listener question responses from a couple weeks back where it was an otter, tech shield, tech sword, and tech light walk into a bar. This was from Dirty Lem who said, there ought to be plenty of punchlines, but I can't think of any. <laughs> ah, puns. Yes, gotta love them. Uh, last week's listener question was, what is an early game item you would like to see added to the game and why? And we had quite a few responses. Lee Man 27 said, A snorkel would be nice for some early game ocean exploration, but only hold like two minutes or so of oxygen. And I really like that. Mm. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Yeah. Especially since for the longest time you could only get oil from the ocean. Nowadays you can go to the north or the snow bomb to get it. But even then, for low levels, it's pretty much a tough task. <laughs> Given how quickly you'll die in the snow, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, I wish Ulti was here because uh, SparkWolf90 said something to lure thylacos out of the trees, dare I say, some catnip. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so I immediately replied to him saying, I hate you so much right now. And he responded, why? I'm just asking for a new chemical to be added for, or a new chem to be added for early game. Those style thylos are just such cute cats why can't there be some catnip to lure them out early game item i swear real question clearly didn't listen to last week's episode <laughs> well he must have if he answered the question and then uh drake vanders had a couple uh several things to say there are a few items for early game i can think of right off the bat one knives in the earliest form it would be a flint knife and could be improved to better versions with metal later on it would function as a multi-purpose tool early game Think of it like sharing traits with some other tools like the sickle, hatchet, and pick. When used on plants, they gather fiber more quickly, but at a lower rate than the sickle. When harvesting creatures, they give a chance at giving prime meat, even if said creature doesn't normally give prime, in addition to a small but consistent amount of hide and pelt. When used as a weapon, knives wouldn't do much damage on their own, but would inflict a nasty bleeding de- debuff on players. I really like this. You know... Yeah. I would, I would say, uh, dispute the fact that uh, they they should they should actually be one of the more damaging weapons, but just have the lowest possible uh, range. Just on the basis of, I mean, you'd be amazed how lethal knives actually are. Yeah, I'll support this with a slight tweak. Make them throwing knives, huh? like Metro. <laughs> oh, I can't wait for that new Metro game. Uh, his second item: backpacks. Backpacks would be a great early game item. They wouldn't increase their carry limit. Uh, instead, they give a weight reduction when crafting them. For example, you can make specific backpacks which reduce the weight of specific resources such as stone, wood, and metal. One such backpack could be a wood holder placed in your offhand slot which reduce weight of wood by 20%. Another great idea, I think. I love this idea. Oh my god, this is an amazing idea. It'd yeah. be like a dino. Uh, I mean, it'd be something you carry on yourself and you could chuck down just like a dino. Yeah, I mean, we use uh, monkeys, little monkeys for yeah, weight reduction. Yeah, monkey backpacks. Yeah. But I love the idea of just having a regular backpack, not just a backpack, but for one for specific resources. That's a great idea. And then his final one was two-handed clubs. In relation to Rico's mention of the Nunchucks. Warhammer, is some form of a two-handed heavy club, such as a bone club or simply just a crude stone hammer. I think these weapons would inflict a specific deep buff, which could either slow down opponents or, like other games, make enemies hit with a hammer take more damage for a brief period of time. Hmm. Two-handed weaponry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, what can I say? I like hammers. We know. <laughs> you like to hammer it. It's hammer like that guy in Game of Thrones, right? <laughs> no spoilers. Sorry, here. I haven't watched since like Sorry, season no three. Let's scratch that. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I should also mention I don't particularly care. I'm and so now, the comments. <laughs> 
I like the show. It's fun. It's just I obviously prefer the books more. And chances are we'll never see the end in for the books ever. Thank you, George R. R. Martin. Really appreciate you giving us blue balls. May God rest his soul. <laughs> oh, no, don't say that. <laughs> I was oh. going to say, what, did, did he die? And I, I didn't notice. I mean, I wouldn't have cared <laughs> particularly other than his contributions to fantasy writing, oh, which I no. do respect immensely. Yes. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, Kibonika Wolfboy reminded us of an old suggestion he had made. Saying, so you know my suggestion for previous podcasts was an early tier weapon, aka the shock arrow, they could add to the game. We can also see like a glider, one fiber and the other with hide people so people can jump off cliff cliffs or bases catching long air rides. I like the, I like the idea. I do like the idea, but I think it kinda undermines some of the roles that some of the dinos are supposed to fill. Right? Yeah, like the uh, archaeopteryx, uh, the parachute yeah. bird. But, but I mean to be fair though, it kinda goes back to the backpack thing, right? It, the backpack mm-hmm. would undermine the monkey. Not necessarily because you don't use the monkey to carry wood, stone, and all those heavy resources around. But I mean it does have a weight reduction buff, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Yeah, it, it cuts anything you put in its inventory by half when you carry it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh Basilis Evolve said Chum. Drop it off the side of a raft and watch the feeding frenzy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like bait. Yeah, okay. I like it, especially if you're going out fishing. That, that would be a good way yeah. to bring all those fish to you. Hmm. Yeah. Piranhas, mostly. I finally got a fishing rod. I had to trade for it, but I have yet to uh, go out and do some fishing because every time I pop up, people are trying to kill me. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> Black <laughs> Blackfire Joe says... Hey, Sean and crew, I've been giving this a lot of thought. How about a tourniquet or some sort of makeshift cast as an early game item? You can maybe gather thatch, fiber, and wood for early versions of this, but maybe later on can craft them using metal or something. We can all remember being new to the game and getting attacked by dinos or falling off a high cliff and taking damage. When you are badly injured, your health is low and the broken bones icon appears. How cool would it be to go into a small animation of your character putting a makeshift cast on their leg, or let's say your character is badly bleeding and throws a tourniquet on their arm to prevent a bleed out. Or maybe even some sort of medical tools for PvP where if you were to get shot, you could have another tribe mate extract the bullet wound to slightly heal you. Or maybe even have a buff called Adrenaline Rush. You could take 15% less damage and increase movement speed by 15% for certain situations. Because, well, let's face it, I think as humans we would have an Adrenaline Rush seeing a dinosaur or being in a shootout. Just some ideas I had and wanted to know what you guys thought. Keep up the awesome work. I have new... I have now completely caught up with all of your ARC podcasts and did a and did have a comment or question. I was wondering what's the craziest or most ridiculous alpha server rules you guys have seen. I used to be a part of a server where one of the alpha rules was absolutely no taming trikes. I still don't understand why. Jeez. I, 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 I can't beat that one, actually. There's a lot of content in there. There's a lot of questions in there. Well, now, first of the, all, the I problem with a lot of those buff things isn't that they're not good ideas, because honestly, they are. Uh, there's just not a lot of like buff-related... Um, mechanics or or if there were perks to help customize out characters by making you a little better better at this or a little better at that based on you know perk distribution or something uh, it'd be one thing you could you could come up with a lot of ways to play off that kind of mechanic into little buffs and and other things like that especially if you uh massively slowed down healing uh, mm. uh, uh without the right per uh, in you know you, you don't get the current healing unless you actually have like a fast the fast healing perk or something the problem, of course, being that that kind of system isn't in ARC uh, whatsoever to start with. Yeah. So you can't play off... I mean, you, you can't just add in a buff system to the current way ARC works, because then you get... Um, well, everybody remembers the fun metric change that happened when we got the uh, veggie cakes. <laughs> and yeah. Brontos. Mm-hmm. In theory, I kind of like the idea of a cast. Because how many times have you been like a new fetch survivor... You're being chased down by, you know, let's say a Rex or even a Raptor. You break your leg, and now it's all game over, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you quickly hit your hot bar, you put on your cast, and boom, you're off and running. And uh, maybe throw some stim berries on there for uh, stamina. But uh, <laughs> I don't know if it really makes sense. Like, like oh, I'm being attacked by um, Raptor. Let me stop and put on my cast. It doesn't make sense, but I do like the idea of having this in the game, especially for an early game item because while you can't make metal medical brews at any level technically well not any yeah any level well technically 
whatever level you get uh, unlock uh, narcotics from because it only requires tinder bears and narcotics to make medical brews. Problem is, it's a very laborious task. It's when not you're instant a newbie. Yeah, it's not instant. It takes if you're using a uh, a cooking pot, it takes a while to make. Just well, one just the method. effect takes a while too. The heal isn't not yeah. an instant. Heal. It's a heal over time buff. And and to the latter question about the most ridiculous rules, I don't know if this is the most ridiculous. I just one I particularly love the most is we would occasionally get refugees that would come in talking about the uh, property taxes they'd have to pay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know the funny part was the every time anyone heard, said anything about taxes, my libertarian sense kicked uh, kicked in, and I I just felt this moral outrage. Tea party time. <laughs> Tea party time. I mean, we've heard the standard rules where no metal structures of any kind, no turrets of any kind. Yeah, like, no metal structures of any kind. I mean, Jesus Christ, that's like... At least really back when the Bastardos ruled eight in the early days, It uh, there was, well, of course, uh, certain members of the tribe never really followed the rule, but if you wanted to avoid ever getting raided by them, the best way to do it was just not move up to metal. Ha! Well, yeah, I know. Was, of- uh, uh, what was it, Yoda and a couple of his buddies? I mean, yeah. I remember those days. Like, there was a point where I was kind of hiding my metal capabilities with stone coverings. Because when you're in metal, people kind of assume you've got certain gear that you may or may not have, right? Mm-hmm. Well, James' but if you're stone, uh, preferred tactic was uh, as soon as someone had like replaced their foundations with metal, but they hadn't gotten all the walls yet, that meant they probably had at least some of the materials for, uh, for it. So that meant payday. So you grenade through the stone and use, well, usually right. I think by the time a big tribe's at that level where they can just do that easily, they don't really care about the materials that a Stone Age tribe has. That's always been kind of the balance of the whole thing. So what do you think of the rule of no taming trikes? I think it's hilarious. Why? So I I don't understand. It's an early tank in Dino for the most part. I I I literally think it was just a troll test. Somebody they they're looking for people to tr- to tame it just to be defiant and they're like okay those are the crew we got to go after. <laughs> All right, uh, so cool dice comes back to us with this problem from last week where he was talking about uh, the tame limit and says me and my friend have our own private server but it is ruined because of the tame limit and we only have about twenty dinos each so how does one remove the tame limit? I even killed some of my poop rexes and then I knocked a dodo out and still couldn't tame. Wait a minute, what? You can't control that as a server admin? You should be able to. I'm pretty sure there's a command. Now, um, on PvE servers, it's a 200 tame limit. PvP is 500 tame limit per tribe. Something like that at the time. Um, there, I'm pretty sure there is a command. If, you, if you're the admin of the server, you should be able to change that. Though I do remember a while back where there was some kind of uh, issue with the game where it believed tribes had already reached a tame limit when they were nowhere near to doing that. You know, I don't know if there's any kind of uh, resolution uh, to it. I, I keep seeing on the forums that the PVEers are pl- complaining that they're kind of running into a lot of issues that are being driven by design changes driven by the PVPers. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of sympathetic to that. Yeah, and we will hit that later because our main topic is going to be patch 265, which brought lot, quite a few significant changes yeah, that's right. to the, the meta. Uh, Solo Grip says, I think if they added a crafting station in between mortar and pestle and the chemistry bench, possibly an apothecary bench, the difference between the mortar and the chem bench is insane. Feels like for mid-game there could be room to add another option. Making spark powder and gunpowder and mortars until you can get a chemistry bench is insanely tedious and time-consuming. Not essential by any means, but it would be a nice quality of life improvement. Give it up, my dudes. What about a, uh, a horse is a chem bench, isn't it? Yes. Yes. So maybe they should buy And quite effective, actually. Um, Mm -hmm. However, I will say this. It isn't any faster than than a mortar and pestle. Well, that's what I mean. Buff it, and then make that be the... There's another thing I can say. um, Unlike when you craft things in your own inventory in the horse, you can be moving. Of course, if you're making, you know, spark powder, you're Mm -hmm. not going to be moving uh, because stone, but... I kind of like the idea of though dinos serving the purpose of high tier uh, crafting stations, like uh, <laughs> a fire wyvern being a forge. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> Drake Vanders agreed with Solar Groups. He likes the idea, saying, "I totally agree with this. I know I've been pushing for more interest in the mid tier items that just don't exist yet. An apothecary alchemist table would be ideal as a middle ground. There are other things that would benefit greatly with an in between item that just takes either less room or is more efficient in crafting its chosen items." 
Yeah. You know, I would have said a year ago that the Alchemist Cable was not appropriate for the lore of the game, but now, seeing as we live in a world with wyverns <laughs> and <laughs> rock comms, kind of throws that point. The well, I mean, there's something to remember about alchemy. Well, we tend to associate all these mystical terms, or actual alchemists, historically speaking, were just chemists that didn't understand the actual scientific underlines of what they were doing. They, they just wanted magic, gold. and they were wrong. It was just science. <laughs> yes, and the original scientists were philosophers. Yeah. That's not, that's pretty accurate. So, I mean, well, and priests. Can't forget about the priests. <laughs> now, uh, Mooseman talked about the Fav Sniper, saying the Fav Sniper nerf was unwarranted. The secret ghillie nerf was great because 1K durability gill, ghillie was overpowered as hell. They need to buff long necks, though. A 250% damage long neck would hit for 233 HP if it hit a piece of clothing that had an armor rating of 200. Hmm. I do feel like the gap between like a god tier fab rifle and a long back primitive is pretty friggin' huge. Yeah, I kind of feel like there should be. I always thought that the between. base damage on a long neck should be bigger than the base damage on the uh, on the uh, fab sniper. Well, right, because it fires faster. Well, isn't it? The base damage for a long neck is much higher than a base damage for the sniper rifle. Is it? Fab sniper. Yeah, pretty sure. Okay. Why did I think otherwise? I'll put down my know. pitchfork. <laughs> <laughs> you have a pitchfork handy? Yeah, I always... Don't you? I got my you pitchfork think, and torches but, uh, no, ready to no. go at a moment's notice. See, I'm the kind of person, if I can't have a chainsaw and a bolter, I don't see the point of, ha- <laughs> uh, uh, of having, uh, having uh, you know, outrage weapons handy. <laughs> uh, what can I say? I need, uh, I need a chainsaw and a uh, bolter, and then I need to find the nearest Antifa rally. Oh, man. Okay, moving on, moving on. Kimaniko Wolf, I made another comment saying, As for PvE side, I play mostly by myself these days, reason being my tribe mates are off playing the newest game or grinding out an event from another game. I kind of need a break as well from ARC time after time. If I was to play PvP, I'd end up by myself with nothing over and over, trying so hard, getting a foot in anywhere as well, reaching quotas for staying in the tribe as well. But to say I would be dedicating my time to keep my area safe, when my neighbor's Lakota tribe left, I was grinding out 14 days when permanent two times wasn't a thing yet, making 200 stone behemoth gates and frames. You already know I play primitive PvE, which is hard, very hard, because of some tames with low health pools are very hard to tame at high levels as well. You don't have any weapons that are to pass crossbows, so much as well building a trap on the spot for a dino you want to tame. You can't just pick it up put it into a box you want to tame it in. You might have to rely on dinos to help you more, though. The area we all know, the Diplocolis, as well as soups to do diving trips, since we can't have scuba gear, it's a better option for us, as we wish could at least have some gear that's better, but they have been ignoring us and not really playtesting, saying we should add more stuff since barely any application here. I mean, I get the, you know, have the, the constant grind on being an official PvP player, maintaining everything and all that, but eh. yeah, I'm not sure what what he was going for. What should be changed? Yeah, he he wasn't saying anything needed to change. Just saying why he was playing PVE more than you know PVP because that was yeah. one thing that I brought was up. Say, if there was a point episode. under that uh, under that, I was going to accuse it of word salad. He was just explaining something that it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it was last week where I was talking about why do people play. I was just asking in general why do people play PVE? Don't you get bored? Well, I mean, not to rehash that entire topic, but I, I think the game does offer PVE, a lot of PVE content. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I don't think it's as long-lasting as PVP. Definitely a lot, especially when you keep getting wiped. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, Basilisk Evolved also added, uh, by the way, do you recommend reading the notes? So talking about the Explore notes, they're all on the wiki. Translated and all was a pain in the butt until they added built-in ones. No, I'm going to need to do that because I haven't taken the time to gather all the Explorer notes myself. You know, I still, when I, whenever I go through the wiki, though, I'm still really disappointed at some of the things that just have not been updated in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and then final That's comment. That's a wiki for you. That is a wiki yeah. for you. <laughs> final comment is from Twisted Puppet. He said, did that Starborn guy not read any of the announcements about the new servers? Legacy will be locked off i.e. you won't be able to transfer anything from Legacy to the new servers. New servers are a fresh start like the wipe many of us asked for. Dude doesn't know how to pl- pay attention sometimes. Him and the rest of his tribe also don't understand that Wildcard doesn't give to 
uh, yeah, Shanks of Alay about leg- legacy. That's why they're abandoning those uh, servers upon launch and letting the dupers run wild. All focus is now on the new servers. Legacy will be left to rot after launch. Starborn's tribe is also responsible for the existence of the Exodia Rexes, a.k.a. God Rexes, so they have no room to be talking about cheating. I believe yeah. this was in regards to uh, what tribe was it? Legacy last week? Where a bunch of videos are, you know, I almost want to revisit the question about hey, whether are we planning to go play on legacy or new service? Because my opinion is slowly evolving over time. Because I, I, I really was, I, I think Wildcard kind of had a PR misstep here. Mm-hmm. Because right now the perception is legacy, as I kind of said, was going to be a problem in previous podcasts, is being perceived as kind of like the, the second class citizens of Ark. I and, don't and know the new why, servers don't because... even exist yet. They don't even exist yet. Yeah. All it really is is a new cluster. And it's a new cluster that's going to be infested with the exact same problems within a couple of weeks. Yeah, and people seem to think that Wildcard is going to just drop Legacy. No, because Wildcard said that we're getting the DDoS protection the, uh, and all the new stuff that the new servers will get when they're launched. Right now? You know, I'm, I'm sure Wildcard will put just as much effort into fixing the problems on, on the Legacy servers as they do right now. I mean, it's the same code. <laughs> it's the same code. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I, I mean, looking at it right now, they have 30,000-plus players playing on these servers. Maybe half of them or a third of them migrate to the new servers. Mm-hmm. They they still are going to treat these old servers just like... I mean, at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is the same code base, the same game version, just a different cluster. So you might think, like, well, that old cluster has all kinds of nonsense from all the duping, my prediction, again, going back to previous podcasts, is going to be it's going to happen on the new cluster. Mm-hmm. So what I'm really hoping is that at some point in the future there becomes there's a merge. Maybe three months, six months from now, I can't predict when it's going to be, but they'll merge it back in. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the new servers, we're still waiting. Uh, Wildcard Studio said that they would be li- releasing a list of servers that would be taken down for- for my yeah, know, are not popular or not popular, but not that was supposed to be active. today, wasn't it? That was supposed to be today, uh, which is Tuesday. We record every Tuesday at 10 30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and we post every Wednesday. A tweet came out from Jet saying the server info slash migration announcement will be posted on Wednesday now. Sorry, guys, oh. the team is busy as ever preparing for launch. Mm. Ah, yep. wild card sense of time. <laughs> I'd love to know if any of the old servers we used to romp around on are on that list or not. Ah, uh, probably. I wouldn't be surprised to see 732. I would not up be on surprised there. to see 732 on that yeah. list. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've not seen it with a population higher than two or three lately. Yep. Now, uh, speaking of things being pushed back, the console PC dedicated servers patch was uh, update was pushed out for the PlayStation 4. When somebody, an Xbox player, asked about the Xbox, Jad simply said it's been pushed back to September, and this is because they have to do some additional stuff for Microsoft. In yep. order for it to happen. Common problem with console releases, you're kind of subjected to the uh, release cycles of the console platform. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, Xbox guys. You're going to have to wait for those console PC dedicated servers. Now, uh, somebody we might know posted on the Reddit forums uh, by the name of Lieutenant Colonel. Making what? a suggestion. Re-enable auto guns on land-based platform dinos. Holy crap, I forgot I posted this. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap, that's right, I did post a thing. <laughs> and you wrote, it's been several months since this controversial change. While I think it's helped the game balance overall, I'd like to see this feature return for land dinos. As of right now, all platform dinos are used for is building a box on their back to protect the driver to tank turrets. I think this has resulted in a pre-born game meta. Make Brontos great again. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap, I really need to pay more question, uh, attention to your... Uh... Your sheet of uh, <laughs> <laughs> links. <laughs> um, yeah, well, so where I was going with this was just that, you know, whenever I watch, so I watch a lot of, of ARC on Twitch, mm-hmm. and whenever platform dinos are called into battle, all the Mega Tribe battles, it's literally just a Brano with a cube and a pillar on its back. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty freaking boring. I, I want to see Brano's with, like, bases and weaponry and turrets and all kinds of stuff when it's just like literally a blank platform and a box i I don't think you could do anything more boring than that but i mean that's the meta i mean there's no no reason to do it otherwise than that 
Yeah, they're just there for tanking and nothing else. Exactly. You know, we want proper siege weapons. I mean, you look at Lord of the Rings, where you, they brought in the big Oliphants, and they had all these guys, or they had like a siege tower one with guys shooting arrows from it and things like that. You want you want stuff like that being right. the Brontos and Parasers. Exactly. But yeah, I think it's kind of time to bring back the turrets onto uh, platform saddles, at least for land-based titles. Though I'd still love to see yeah, them for I, Quetzals I, again. Totally. I mean, I, I I realize that Quetzal platforms with auto guns was a lot of fun, but I totally get why they got rid of yeah. them. Yeah. But just, um, I I do think that there needs to be a limit of how many turrets you can have on a platform. Yeah, fair platform. enough. Maybe four. I put up with that. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I, can, I can see four. Although uh, I'd like it to be six personally, just because coverage. Yes, that's a good point. <laughs> now, uh, Caligula QC asked, "What is a typical life in a Mega Tribe on official?" And he writes, "I play PS4 on uh, single player because admin commands can help me survive the bugs and still have fun, but I am sometimes lonely since I have a job and family. Official always felt I would not have a chance to do anything fun." What if I was part of a huge tribe? I play about four hours a day if I average my days off and work days, so I'm not sure if I can be useful to any tribe and still have fun. So what are people like me doing in a big tribe? Would I just harvest uh, supplies all day just to be allowed to ride a parasaur, or would it be better than playing alone? It sounds fun to be on a populated server that should not be wiped, but I want to make sure I would be able to enjoy the game and not just grind for others. Anyway... What's life for you in a big tribe, and how much time do you spend grinding versus playing? You know, that's a good question. Um, I would say you still spend a lot of time grinding, but the gr- the level of materials that you're playing in during your grind is insanely higher. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're just a lot more efficient because you have a lot more infrastructure in place. Yeah, I mean, a mega tribe really turns into like a, its own town where it needs its blacksmiths, it needs its armorers, it needs its uh, farmers, or and all of that. You know, it's a society in many ways. Yeah, very much so. And there, the, and it, it's, it gets to be very different depending on what, tri- what mega tribe it is. Yeah. I mean, if you're, uh, if it's a mega tribe that's strictly out there for PvP and just fighting and fighting, it's a lot different than a tribe that maybe focuses more on breeding dinos and just building up and farming. But yeah, a guy who only plays four hours a day on average is actually a pretty good deal, especially for any tribe. You could, uh, yeah, chances are you probably do a lot of farming, but probably get to do a lot of fighting as well. Yeah. You know, it all depends on how the tribes are run. I mean, when we were running our tribes, we were pretty much. For the most part, anybody could do whatever they wanted, and we'd have some roles. If you wanted to be a farmer, if that was your thing, fine. You know, farm whatever you wanted, unless we really need something in a pinch. You know, things like that. We were pretty laid back for the most part. Yeah, well, yeah, that was always one of the big things was, you know, like, we always just, you know, do whatever you want. Um, there might be a couple projects that we put up at the top that uh, somebody needs to work on. It doesn't really matter who, it could be everybody, it could be a few people, mm-hmm. but, you know, like, say we need a processing station out in this location. Okay, whatever. Yeah. But everybody, for the most part, just got to do whatever they want to until some looming threat on the horizon caused one of the leaders to actually start barking out orders. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the advantage of rarely barking out orders, when you actually do, uh, stuff tends to get done. Yeah. Very, and of course, never true. in the amounts you want, but um, that that's usually a matter of the fact that you know you don't you aren't preparing ahead of time quite enough. <laughs> you know, just to do a little frozen throwing inside baseball. One of the things that I always found kind of interesting in hindsight was that there were certain people that really wanted the structure of like you are the farmer, you are the breeder. And there are other people that just kind of wanted to do their own thing. And it was really super hard to find a good balance between that. Well, that was the thing. You know, we had the structure, but you didn't have to exactly follow it. You could still do whatever you wanted. It's yeah. just some people were really busy undermining the entire thing because they wanted to either take it over or just destroy it. I think some people really want super hard structure and some people want super not structure. Well, those two extremes you'll never make happy, unfortunately. That's right. I right. still remember at one point just saying to somebody, look, there are certain things you want that uh, if I'm constantly telling you why we're not doing them, maybe you should take that as a hint. Yeah. 
<laughs> we still got to do that episode, but like I said, we, you know, launch is coming up, which is the launch game launch date is next week, next Tuesday. Yeah, we'll see. About sure that. it is. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's let's move on. Swaggy K says air PvP is terrible and writes everyone has the exact speed. It's literally chase each other around until someone runs out of stamina. Wyvern fights used to be fun. Now I can't catch up to a wyvern, and if I do use the attack, I'll lose stamina and never gain the person again. The wyvern went from being one of the most feared creatures to a mount that is just used to travel the map because it has the highest base speed. Yeah, air PvP sucks. I agree. Mm, yeah, I mean, in the middle of one, it's one of these big fights, so air PvP is still pretty prevalent, but air PvP, strictly air PvP, is nothing like it used to be. I mean, the concept is good. Uh, the mm-hmm. dinos that support it are good. It's just the, the 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 engine, the lagginess, it just doesn't quite gel. Yeah. Not to mention, you, you can't stay up in the air as long as you used to, because the barrel roll takes a lot more stamina than it does. It's got the three-second cool down before you can use it again for example to be fair i might just be trying to make excuses for how bad i am at picking people <laughs> i accepted that i sucked that a long time ago <laughs> i was eh... yeah it could be lucky shots but uh yeah i mean pv air pvp alone by itself is has really gone down and he's he's right it's really about who has the most stand that'll get away or get their guy. Hmm. It's, I think this is something we'll have to go back in more depth. Well, I mean, remember when the as and, and, and as much as I did hate the uh, or as much as I was a very big proponent of it. The fact is, um, I was in warfare. I was a dedicated dragon rider for a couple months, and then they did this the, the speed nerf, and I I I can't remember how long it was before I actually brought a dragon into combat again, and that would just pr- uh, provide battlefield artillery from a hillside. Yeah. Yeah, something we ought to... I think this will be a topic for a future episode where we can look into it more and really maybe come up with suggestions or ideas of what can make it more uh, more enjoyable again. In the meantime, Air 401 writes, would Dubin be as prevalent if the game wasn't so arc maintenance evolved? And he writes... We have to log in every few days to refresh timers on bases. We have to log in every few days to feed our dinos. We have to log in every few days or week to make more gasoline. We have to log in every few hours to raise and imprint our babies. We have to spend hours to gather materials to do the above. We have to spend hours gathering to spend 10 minutes of PvP. We have to spend weeks breeding to attempt broken and OP bosses. We have to spend hours gathering to build Anything bigger than a 4x4 metal box that would pr- that probably won't be there in the morning. We have to spend hours gathering materials to summon the bosses. I know, let's just do. There will always be people that cheat no matter how easy things are, but I can't help but wonder if the grind wasn't so intense that we as players would be able to do the things we enjoy more and get to the heart and meat of the game without having to resort to cheating. I feel the underlying problem isn't so much broken code to allow people to take advantage and dupe, but the feeling that they need to do in order to not only enjoy the game and what it has to offer, but also to keep competitive and able to defend themselves. We got a permanent boost of times too, which helped, but I don't think it was enough. Boosting the rates isn't the answer, though. I believe the game mechanics and whatnot need to be changed or balanced. I think the short answer here is that it, people are, it, by nature, are always going to do whatever they can to get an edge. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how easy it is to farm metal. If there's a way to dupe it easier, they're going to do it. Or at least a certain segment of the population is. Yeah. So, yeah, if the game wasn't as grindy, I think it would cut down on some of the duping, but... Let's well, I think it would cu- it would cut down the 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 difference between the dupers and the non dupers is what mm-hmm. it would do. It would undermine their advantages a little bit. Right. I mean, for us as a tribe, we didn't dupe. We did everything legit because you know that's how we played. That's how we were. Now it, it boils down also to the character of the person. When somebody all they care about is duping and not really wanting to work hard, well, that kind of reflects on their character, really. Yeah. Though, to be fair, when you had to gather, when you want to make a a set of Ascendant Riot Armor, and you got to farm for 10,000 poly at minimum, Uh, there's a problem with the game. Yeah, it's kind of insane at that point. You know, I do think that a lot of the blueprints and the things 
mat requirements for a lot of these things need to be reworked. To counter that, though, I would say that the folks that say, like, well, of course we do, because, you know, everyone dupes. We have to do. I hate that attitude. Yeah, everyone does not dupe. We never duped. We never will. So, uh, yeah, that's a BS argument. Yeah, but we weren't the people they were competing with. Right. That's a good point. <laughs> but once again, it doesn't matter who you're competing against. There's no just agree- justification for duping. Just man up and show. Yeah, up. I mean, if somebody said, hey, like, day, you could get a thousand, you know, tech rifles if you just crash OS8, go ahead and do it. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. No, I mean, true enough. But my, my point is, there is a certain bit of the uh, understandability of the mindset of all the people we're fighting right now are doing this. If we're going to be able to compete with them at the same level. No, I understand the mindset. I, I totally I mean, understand I the mindset. Rather, I'm just I'd disagreeing rather, with you it. Know, but that's the thing. No matter how big you are, there's always going to be somebody bigger out there. And well, that's... there's a difference between bigger and, you know, uh, two people that are roughly around the same, you know, score. I'm talking about when, when we, you know, if you know the other side's doing this and you're doing it to compete against them, it, it actually leaves the board being fair. The problem is that doesn't excuse the fact that it was done in the first place. Mm-hmm. See, before we actually got wiped in the worst possible way, I always figured we'd get wiped by a mega tribe. You know, guys who had a hundred players, who had hundreds of Rexes and hundreds of Brontos and hundreds of Quetzals and thousands of Terras. It's one of the and, biggest ironies of our tribe. Yeah, we were really... always afraid of the big invaders. We were always afraid of the big mega tribe coming See, in. I was not the afraid. I was just, of that. I considered it a foregone conclusion. It was going to happen no matter what. And, and all did. I cared about was that we would put up the best fight we could ever mount and go out in a blaze of glory. That's all I cared about. It didn't happen in fairness, that way. The last thing that happened at the, uh, at the uh, during the Battle of Fall of Iceberg was me, uh, Shovel, and Domo mounting up on a, a war quetzal, blaring danger zone through the spe- uh, speakers and <laughs> charging their line. There for that. So, I mean, <laughs> it, we, we when, when, the, when oh. the quetzal died underneath me and I fell into the uh, water, I actually had to swim back to the iceberg with a with a spino chasing me. <laughs> I, I made it. Serious narrator voice. The biggest enemy was ourselves. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Uh, Consecration says, how do, or asks, how do people breed 36K HP and 800 melee rexes? I have some understanding, but not a full understanding in any rights. So I did some research, and I'm aware that if I was to get to, say, six rexes, each with a very high stat in each area, then crossbreed them all, I would eventually end up with a rex that has all six of those high values. With the right time and luck, of course. But how do people get rexes with 36,000 HP and 800 melee? It seems to me that I could either get one or the other, but not both through level and after breed. For example, I'm breeding these two Rexes currently, and if I get the HP and melee, they always have 9,020 HP and 355% melee. Well, I bred both a 132 Rex and a 227 Rex, both with the HP and melee. I understand that. The 132 inherited the HP and melee of the parents, but how do I get that base melee to be higher than 355? Is there any mutations. way to get that high? Without well, mutations. How oh, big I have are, no idea. <laughs> how big are stat mutations anyways? After 40 stat mutations to a breed line, to a breed line, really that much of a difference? Or is there something else I'm completely missing here? Any and all information is greatly appreciated as I'm just getting into breeding now, and I would like to min-max the F out of this system. As a Dodo breeder, I'm not really sure I'm qualified to answer this question. I think this is all you well, I think it's a combination <laughs> of, three, uh, uh, of three things. One, when people talk about... Uh, okay, when you're breeding... There are your your parent parental stats. There's uh, which, which are of course going to include you know your wild taming bonus etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, then you get your uh, your printing uh, your printing bonus, which of course doesn't actually breed uh, breed through. But if you know your three fifty seven Rex always gets the same uh, you know forty uh, points or whatever it is from a full imprinting, then if you full imprint the babies, you'll end up with that same, you know, over uh, overhead each time. And as your uh, and, and something to remember, these are percentage based systems. So whenever you increase one uh, a stat by a slight amount, every point you put into it is going to actually be worth even more. And your percentage base, your level base increases to the damage percent, 
are going to be based on its current melee. So let's say you know you got you end up with a four hundred percent after uh, after imprinting and say one mutation. You're going to be getting more melee per level than the three fifty uh, whatever it was, and that's pretty much how you do it. A combination of mutations, the imprinting bonus. And and uh, obviously, getting 100% imprint is important if you want the really high level Rexes. Now, I've heard people talk about how it's possible to do it with no imprinting bonus, and at that point, I have no idea. I only know what I list, what I picked up while listening to the actual breeders talk. So the biggest thing is taming wild dinos as much as you can because that gives you a great boost to your bloodline. When you get that, that was always my that was always my gig was I would be the guy who would one day just show up when people were breeding wolves and go hey uh, what's our, what's our wolf lines ba- uh, base HP uh, forty wild levels uh, ready to restart the entire uh, the entire <laughs> HP side of the line guys I just brought you another five yeah because it really is all about luck in your tames that, that's really what it boils down to for the most part because that's what gives a great big jump start in the beginning. You get that lucky couple of teams where they got the really high HP and the really high melee, and then you can just start working from there. And you know, but as you're working on your bloodlines, you should have people still constantly tame those 130 level 130 plus dinos to see if they get that one set with like 50 I, I've got plus a points. Weird anecdotal thing that was always my go-to rule: mm-hmm. two standard deviations below max level, or three standard deviations below max level. Back when it was, uh, you know, 120, that meant I would only tame things 108 or above. Same thing goes, but now it's 135. In my experience, and this not bared out by any kind of actual math I've done, it's just literally, you know, playing the game for two years and, and being a guy who mostly just tamed things. Like that's sort of been my thing this whole time. Mm. At two deviations below the maximum... I always seem to get the best single stat. Now, I'd often have a lot of really crappy stats in the dino, but one stat would be amazing. If I went for a higher level, and closer to max, I'd get a more even distribution, which was great for overall use, but when you're trying to contribute to a breeding line, it doesn't matter if every single stat but one is crap, if that one is freaking awesome. Right. When you have a bear with a 42 with a forty two base wild level of... Uh, uh, 42 level breed uh, breed of of HP. That thing's gonna have titanic health. Mm-hmm. If you breed it in with the you know the thir- uh, the 45 melee one you have and the 35 stamina one you have, now you've got a nice line of battle bears. <laughs> so um, once the game launches, I'm gonna be we'll be doing main topics again with this show where we're gonna go back to basics, talk about all the stuff where if you're just starting out the game. We'll, we, we'll help you with what you need to know about how to get where you need to go. Be and topical Braden's with the relaunch. Those. Yeah, just keep it with the relaunch. Yep. <laughs> now, uh, speaking of things I didn't know, a fluffy cow posted a pro tip, writing, for those of you that don't know, wyvern milk, while crucial in feeding and imprinting baby, baby wyverns, has more important uses than that alone. Wyvern Milk also grants you and any teams you force feed it to immunity to the damage over time from the inflamed debuff given by fire breath attacks from wyverns and the dragon. So, if you've been attempting the dragon boss and have had a difficult time with it, try using Wyvern Milk on your Rexes and uh, boss teams and make them immune to the dragon's deadly fire breath attack that burns away 20% of your team's max health in 10 seconds. Pretty awesome. Did not know that. And we had been messing around with uh, Wyvern Milk when it first came out. You know, we were making uh, um, food recipes with it at one point. Because Because why not? Because why not? (laughs) But yeah, I never knew this. But then again, I never thought to force feed it to a dino either. I didn't even know you could force feed it to a dino. Yeah, especially now when you can't seem to force feed anything down their throats anymore. But uh, yeah. If I ever get to do a Dragon Boss again, I will definitely make sure I uh, have some Wyvern Milk for the fight. Now, I believe it was last week's patch where the Beehive was given uh, slots, no longer made unlimited honey. And uh, Uju wrote, 
I used to have plenty of honey, so I made once a week the sweet veggie cakes for my snails. The hive was up to 200 or something slots full. Two days ago, I removed all honey to add more, or add some more stacks of rare flowers. And today, there were only four honey pots inside. Already half spoiled, and obviously honey production stopped when the eight slots were full. Why is that? And how can I get, again, more honey? It, it is already a hassle to feed those snails. But if I can make only two cakes at a time, it will be too much. There was a dev response from... Uh, Panda saying the slot limit on a vanilla beehive is 45 slots and will stop producing once it reaches full until there is a free slot. Not happy with that. Wow, that a, that, that's a pretty big reduction. I don't have enough experience huge. to comment on it, to be honest. Well, it's two honey per veggie cake. So, um, I mean, it was already a pain to make veggie cakes when the bees, honey, the beehives didn't really have uh, a limit to how much honey they can make. Now, Limited to 45 per hive. That's what, 20 something veggie cakes right there per hive? Well, how much of a difference do the veggie cakes make in the current meta for like. Oh, they're still very important, especially for PvP. So maybe this is the dev attempt to uh, reduce that. Yeah, which uh, we'll go into the main topics pretty soon. We got one, actually, yeah, just one more. And that is Sony will not uh, have cross. Console play for Ark Survival Evolved. Ah. Uh, yeah. I wanted to kill the PlayStation players so bad. <laughs> um, this information came from Wildcard co founder Jeremy Stieglitz, who said that uh, cross play between PlayStation 4 and Xbox One systems working in, is working internally, but that Sony won't allow it in, this public re- in the public release of the game. Now, I can see uh, why they wouldn't. Prior to the PlayStation 4, uh, Sony was kind of at the forefront when it came to cross-platform or cross-console play. But not this uh, generation because they've got their, I think it's the PlayStation View service and all that, where they've got a streaming service for their video games. So they really want to keep a tight lid on their uh, environment. They want some walled gardens around their gaming ecosystem. Yeah, for the most part. It's a real shame because they're going to miss out. But then again... Do you know that Walt Garden is, is the uh, root, uh, is the root origin of the word paradise? Yeah, I found that very Garden strange when I learned that. No, Garden of Eden, all that. That's why. So, just for the uninitiated on the past uh, generation of consoles, what were some of the cross-platform endeavors that Sony was involved with? Ooh. I don't remember. They were mostly crappy games. Uh, some of the MMOs back in the day, I, I know for sure. I'm trying to remember all that. Off of my head. Uh, uh, the last time I uh, I noticed that the PlayStation was going to be, be uh, the PS4 was going to be crappy about crossplay was uh, I was kind of hoping uh, that the uh, that the STO the Star Trek Online they put on the PlayStation would let you log in to your uh, your existing account because mm-hmm. uh, I, I would have been willing to restart and play with some of my friends on the PlayStation in that case. I'd put a lot of time into my uh, into that game already, and I was not going to start over from zero. Man, yeah. same thing with Planetside. Portal yeah, 2, that was or, one of them. Wait, so you could play Planetside, f- or, uh, pardon me, you could Portal play uh, Portal 2 with uh, PlayStation 4 and PC? Uh, not PS4, no, 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 uh, I think it was play- PS3 and computer. PS3, yeah, uh, PS- right. And the PC platform. Hmm. There, there were a few other games, but Portal 2 is the one that comes to my mind. Yeah, that's a game I think it makes sense to do it in, to be honest. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, sorry, Sony guys, you're going to be left out of cross-play. But then again, that's not saying much because Microsoft is limitless between the Xbox One and uh, Windows 10 users, which I'm sure there's all five of those people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I, I mean, uh, so look, to be honest, as far as crossplay is concerned, until it's actually implemented up and running, I wouldn't count our chickens yeah. before they're hatched. I'm hoping that Microsoft will gr- get a brain and you know let it happen. Ah, you're Steam you're well. asking way too much of Microsoft. So, you know, head of, X, uh, Mike, uh, head of Xbox, Phil Spencer, did say that uh, their games could, uh, well, not could, but I'm pretty sure he said that they would be coming to Steam platform as well, because he recognizes the versatility and the power of Steam and how popular it is. So I'm, I'm hoping he sticks to that. He's gonna they that. need to solve the problem of the fact that PC players are an obvious advantage over console players. That's the yeah. core issue. Well, we we see when whenever these games do happen, we see a huge difference between PC and consoles. Always in PC favor, and people don't seem to realize that, or devs, I should say, tend to ignore that particular fact. But then again, we'll see what happens. 
I mean, I don't mean to be negative about it. I want it to work. I want to expand the gaming yeah. community. I want the community to be more like unified. It's just that the platforms have certain inherent advantages between each other that I think mm-hmm. makes cross-platform a little unfair in certain aspects. Especially when it comes to first-person shooters. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's one of the biggest things. The other one would be uh, real-time strategy games as well. There's a huge difference between using a controller and a mouse and keyboard. It's yeah, why, I, you know, I, the I strategy cannot play strategy genre... games on my uh, on a console. I just can't. Yeah. It, it's why the strategy genre isn't that popular on console, because it's not really made for a controller. So you're saying you have not pre-ordered Age Empires 4 on your uh, PlayStation 4? <laughs> No, and to be honest, when I found out it was Relic after their last debacle, I'm, mm. I am, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that 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 Age of Empires Four is going to be an amazing return to classic strategy. But Relic managed to screw up Dawn of War so bad that I just got a half off coupon for them because I own other Relic games. Ooh. <laughs> so, oh. and I'm literally looking at this and going, hmm, Dawn of War three for thirty bucks. I better message my friend that has the, the, that uh, that made the mistake of pre-ordering the game and uh, and see if it's worth that much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go into the main topic, which is obviously patch two sixty five, which came out, and what a patch it is. Uh, first of all, it obviously came out with the tameable Titan boas. You got to feed them a fertilized egg to tame them. So yeah. Okay. Finally. Two years in the making, we can finally tame them. Well, does, uh, I mean, have either you've gotten your Titan bows yet? No. Do yeah. I look like I have dinos to make get fertilized well, eggs? What about that giant wyvern pen you got? Oh, oh man, I forgot about that. Actually, didn't somebody say that fertilized wyvern eggs are the best things to tame them with? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you well, do realize that you can't uh, mate wyverns. So, so just going back to my previous comments and other mm-hmm. podcasts, I, I'm personally still surprised that they made them tameable characters based on how they said that that would probably never happen. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's true. I guess they finally figured it out, or they were just BSing because they didn't want people to tame snakes. I do love how, like, in patch notes of, like, I mean, there's probably 30 or 40 things listed in those patch notes, but it's, it's snakes that we're all kind of obsessed about. Yep. <laughs> now, uh, there were some new server options added as well. The first one, Force Respawn of Wild Dinos on Server Restart. This is enabled by default on official servers. This will force weekly respawns of dinos on all servers to prevent certain dino types, like the Basilo and Spino, from becoming depopulated on long-running servers. Okay. Okay. It's going to make my life a little harder in certain respects, but I'll talk about that at some other point. Uh, another ser- new server option, Tribe size and alliance size limits. The new tribe member limit is defaulted to 70 players, and the new alliance per tribe limit is defaulted to 10 unofficial servers. Note, values may be off by one, so just pick your number and then add one to it. So I want to say at our height, we were probably pushing 70, weren't we? 70 players active? Not active, but just members. Oh, just members. Yeah, on the roster, though. On the roster, yeah, because we really didn't clean out the roster unless... Because... You know, people would come and go all the time, or people would just stop playing, but we figured they might come back. So we had a lot Indeed. of people in the, the roster, but at max, at most, we hit, what, 20 active players? Yeah, at any given times. time, it's probably, t- at the peak time, it's probably 20 players. Yeah. At the peak. Now, but yeah, guess... there might have been 30 active, 20, mm-hmm. like, at the peak, uh, in channel, and maybe, maybe there are 50 members overall. Yeah. Now, here's one of the biggest changes this patch has brought. Platform saddles are now limited to a maximum of 40 saddles per tribe. Each platform saddle with structures counts as 19 tribe tame slots. So one thing I'm unclear about is if this applies to PvP as well. Yes. As far as I think it applies to PvP because they haven't said what it's for. So I assume PvE and PvP. Well, yeah, get up the lag. Man. So, yeah, I don't know. I am really annoyed that they didn't really clarify this. And as far as I know, they still haven't clarified it. I think it's just an effort clarify. to reduce the amount of... Explain what they're doing. <laughs> I mean, uh, to me, what they're trying to do is reduce the number of structures on platform dinos. Yeah. Which is obviously bogging down their uh, netcode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Definitely. So uh, we'll we'll come back to this uh, a little later on. I just want to go through the patch update notes, and we can go into some of these things in more detail. Uh, quarter size Ragnarok map update, the southwest update. Eggs no longer fall through structures during rendering. Baby Ovises should no longer fall through structures after being born. Players can now escape being grappled by an en- by any enemy by using tools with blades to cut the line. <laughs> I like that one. That's a good one, especially for those who... Oh, man. I, I, there, there are times where in PvP I'll see somebody get grappled and they're just being drug, dragged all over the place for a, a long time. And it's like, come on, there's got to be a way to get out of it. Oh, it's such annoying. So that that's a good change. I really like it, especially for PvP. Here's another major one. Turrets now have a players only mode which targets players right in on dinos before targeting the dino. Yeah, we need to get into this one because uh I the, to me the jury still out is whether or not the community likes it or hates it. Yeah. Uh we'll, once again, we will come back to this. Let's just get through the patch notes real quick. Crops can now be fertilized by pressing E on them instead of having to open the inventory. Love that. Awesome. Really love that. Hatching and gestation progress bars now include countdown timers as well as percentages, finally. The structure limit is now properly indicated to the player once the limit is reached. Hmm. Containers and structure inventories now indicate how many slots are full without having to open them. Definitely love this little change. I can just go up to uh, any container or structure and it'll say, you know, 30 out of 45 slots filled, or 45 out of 45, so I know which one's already filled. I'm and assuming that dump. only works for friendlies, though. Yeah, I think. Actually, I haven't tried looking at an enemy. Hmm. I'm going to have to check this later. Uh, corrected the spell, spelling of Palm, Palmina Scorpius. Good for them. Finally. Literally uh, unplayable until they did that. <laughs> it was misspelled? I never even noticed it, to be honest. Uh oh, now here's another one. Pump action shotgun pellets per shot increase from 10 to 12, 20% damage increase on full hit, initial spread decrease from 10 to 7.5, and max cone size at full range decrease from 100 to 75 degrees. Hmm. Shotgun buff. I love a shotgun buff. It definitely needs some buffing. Decrease oh, yeah. stun on humans from shock, shock and trank darts from 5 seconds to 2 seconds. Not too happy about that one. I'd rather have the full five seconds when you knock somebody out with a shock dart. Depends if you're shooting or being shot at. Uh, true. <laughs> they uh, fix three exploits used to get under the world map. When structures or tames are deleted due to the PvE timer expiring, it is now properly communicated in the tribe log, communicated in the tribe log, which I'm very grateful for. Otherwise, I think we're being attacked all the time. Huge performance gains may vary based on system configuration due to upgrading to the latest Unreal rendering code. After changing your in-game settings, be sure to restart your clients. I uh, um, mm-hmm. I don't know about you guys, but I want to say I see a a slight FPS gain in general, but um, SLI is still messed up for me. Yeah. Well, they also... Well, we'll actually get to that in a minute. Um, then they put in a bunch of other patches, which the last one... I think it was today or last night was actually pretty big because it was Ragnarok. 265.1 fixed a renderer crash, renderer crash and further increased render thread slash options performance. 265.14 fixed an issue with clients disconnecting when in large bases. Requires server update. 265.16 fixed some client side third person issues. Made third person camera allowed by default on dedicated servers using the setting allow third person player. So, uh, yeah, you can use third-person camera now in uh, the official servers. Yeah, that's actually super weird. Have you guys played with that one yet? So, uh, no. I noticed a major problem with when I was riding on flyers, or at specifically a Pteranodon, because I have a, a low-level one that I've been hiding for a while now. And it was just janky and jaggy when I would move side to side or move forward. and uh, Man, it was pretty bad. Classic third-person cam it. code problem. Yeah. But what do you think about having third-person mode? I, I think it's appropriate. PvP? I mean, it's appropriate for the genre of game that we're playing here, but it does make it feel a little bit like DayZ. But hey, DayZ's survival. See, my problem is that it gives a huge tactical advantage for those who decide to utilize the third-person mode in a fight. As long as we all have it. Yeah, but I, I hate fighting in third-person mode. I prefer first-person mode, and then when I'm, 
not any danger of being shot at if I'm around a corner. I quick go into uh, selfie camera mode or whatever they call it to quickly look around. But being able to fight in third person mode, that gives you a huge advantage over somebody who decides to just strictly play in first person. I will say this on most of the strains I've been watching, they're still primarily playing in first. Mm hmm. Yeah. Habits are probably hard to break. The game's probably got to be real disorienting now. Well, in that and they probably don't even know that third person mode has been uh, put in because even I didn't really know that I was going through the patch notes. And even yeah. then, you still don't really know it's there. I had to Google how to enable it. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you enable it? You scroll out in your mouse. <laughs> Easy peasy. Now, uh, two, six, so five, just like when you go to third person on a dyno. Yeah. Yeah. Which is weird. Now, 265.17. Fix an issue where eggs could not be picked up by the player after a server restart. Fix additional client-side third-person issues. And then the, the latest update, which was a big one, 265.284, uh, came with Ragnarok map fixes. Uh, extensive. They have a bunch of notes. Fix dinos apparent to fall through ceilings on the client. It may take a minute or so for the server to correct the creatures. Fix buffer overflow error occurring when logging into very dense bases. Fixed certain values being edited that allowed unintended visual changes to be made to the INI files. Review and changes made to graphical presets. Fixed an issue where players would fall through ceilings when logged out on top of them. Finally, I hope. They say. They say, yes. Uh, fixed an issue where binding E to the middle mouse button, mouse button wouldn't function properly. Fix eggs falling through structures for real this time, they added. <laughs> Sure. Uh, <laughs> fixed rec saddle positioning in the die uh, user interface screen. Fixed the industrial cooker and beer barrel from accepting fertilizer due to crop plot change, which I still don't get how that happens in the first place. Fixed a visual issue where the megalosaurus would appear to be sleeping instead of unconscious. Added swing delay to the electric prod. Fixed issue where canvases were not able to be placed on the refrigerator. Fix a visual is issue where the player in inventory would appear as a silhouette. Improved collision on large hatch frame. And finally, allowed the die UI to stay open after jump into paint. So, let's focus on the new changes to the PV that will affect the PvP meta. Now, let's talk about the big one. Turret mode. Now finally working. I did not realize that, the, that it targeting, you know, that sending it to player only was actually supposed to uh, target the player. It was supposed to. And, well, and, I mean, it, and at times it would technically work, but those were rare chances of that happening. When I first got into the game, that was my assumption about how it actually worked. Well, yeah, so they introduced target only mode, uh, what, a year ago? Not even a year ago? Yeah. And it was supposed to target just players and not waste bullets on... Or So the assumption was at the time, and it was supposed to be this way as far as I know, was that it would target just the players so that dinos of any kind couldn't be used to soak the bullets unless you actually had some set to tame dinos as well. But that wasn't the case. Instead, a player shows up on a dino such as a turtle. The turtle would still shoot the turtle while supposedly shooting... which. Supposedly was supposed to be shooting at the human, but hitting the turtle instead. Well, that's no longer the case. Now they actually hit the player instead of hitting the turtle. So this really puts a big the... change for offline raiding, for example. Yeah. You know, turtles were the de facto for offline raiders. You know, the PvEers out there who are the biggest crybabies in the game right now. Oh, jeez. It's true. <laughs> I mean, I saw the threads and everybody complaining are pretty much offline raiders for the most part. You know, that or, you know, just the small tribes that really can't, you know, get the bigger dinos needed for this stuff yet, which I can understand. Fine. So, my the criticisms I've been reading about this whole mechanic are that suddenly now, if you want to tank a base, you just put a box on a Brano and you're done. Mm -hmm. now, I've not seen that in practice yet. I've just, this is reading. Uh, that. Yes, that is still the practice. But then again, that was still the same practice for every pvp encounter and you, you know, kind of hit the nail really on the head use the turtles that I, I was curious about what well, okay so what what's different this time i think what that was different this time is when you're tanking with a brano the guns are shooting or if they even are shooting they're shooting at a box that they can't penetrate right or they're not shooting at all so there was some tests done and um i think it was nerd parade they did some 
test with some diners. They did the, you know, the go-to, the turtle. The player was instantly shot off the turtle once he was in turret range. Then they did the Stego. The Stego's plates actually protected the rider for most of, from most of the shots. The only way it wouldn't protect the rider would be if the turrets were, uh, I've maybe, I'm still not sure about this, but the theory is that if there are turrets well above, direct, pointing directly down at the player, then they will hit the player who's riding a Stego. So the Stego would be your bullet soaker for offline raiders or for the smaller tribes if they want to do this kind of thing now, from what I can gather. Uh, Diplodocus instantly shot off. Giga instantly shot off. The Bronto with a one by one was they were being, the Bronto was getting shot up because I guess the turrets were still shooting at the player. But when they dismounted the Bronto inside that one by one, the turrets stopped shooting, which was really odd. Uh, another odd thing is that the bullets that were hitting the or were missing the player on the Stego or hitting the Stego on the Bronto were going through them and hitting any downs behind them as well, which was really odd. Hmm. That is, yeah, that's weird as hell right there. Yeah. I don't know if that's intentional or a side effect of the new targeting mode, but yikes. Um, it's not a flaw. It's a feature. It's, it's not a flaw. It's a feature. Now they tested it on some flyers. With the Wyvern, when they did just a regular speed flyby, it wasn't hitting the Wyvern, and one or two bullets might have hit the player. On a Pteranodon, unless you're barrel rolling, you're dead. Hmm. They didn't try no, the targeting acquisition systems on those uh, random little pieces of metal are really impressive. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for the most part, this kind of ends a lot of the offline raiding for now, unless they start working on their Stego bloodlines, which are a lot harder to hide. I, yeah, we'll see what happens. But like I said, I mean, I, I don't have a pro- uh, problem with screwing with offline raiders, and as I've said, I've started saying recently, when someone talks about how much of a PvPer they are, you really need to ask them if they're attacking or defending. Because if they're not attacking, then they're they're just talking about being an offline raider. Yeah, but you know, so the separate is even us when we went when we actually went on offensive wars. I mean, we didn't particularly aim for it, but it still ended up being a lot of times we hit people while they weren't there. Because there's a lot, usually a lot more hours where people aren't there than than mm-hmm. they are. So whenever we started a war, we waited until the time where the player was, uh, not the player, but the server was pretty busy. And when we knew they would have people online because we wanted them to have a chance to fight. Now, that was my Still, the first war I ever thing. went to where we planned it to be during prime time, literally we got to their base and everybody yeah. had just logged off to go to dinner. I mean, that was the most ironic thing ever. And we're like, wait, where is everybody? I mean, it wasn't intentional. It's like, you know what? Oh. Screw it. I'm not waiting. Yeah. You know, we, we got a whole to... tribe here. We're ready to go. Exactly. We're not waiting. <laughs> but, you know, I like being able to come up with strategies and tactics fighting while fighting an opponent. And this really forces people to actually plan out some kind of strategy to, aside from using Brontos, the bullet soak and blah, blah, blah. I think it's time for the return of your uh, turtle quets. <laughs> yeah that was you know a good design yep. it was um yeah that's in our uh frozen throne versus starfleet videos which i'm just starting to finally work on the next installment it, it's taken me a while to get to it so hopefully we'll i'll have that up in a couple of weeks and get some videos out again we'll see um yeah it certainly gives smaller tribes a chance to survive an offline raid more and more now I hate turtle tanking. Yeah. I'm all for this. Another thing it does away with is that now that the rider gets instantly killed on the back of the turtle, they can no longer ride a turtle up to the base while taking shots from everywhere and being able to play C4 on the structure, pulling the turtle back, riding it, and then blow, getting a breach. Pretty much not the, uh, can't do the fall of EA again. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Now, let's talk about the platform saddle change. Jet replied to a particular thread for saying that the reason for this change was due to how costly platform servers are on servers when they have structures on them. There's a limited amount we can have on a server at a time, so now players will have to consider those limits when it comes to their tribe. A.K.A. the biggest, baddest tribe will uh, start murdering off anybody who tries to take up their limit. Mm-hmm. Anything that improves performance of the server overall, though, I think is good. 
Yeah. So I'm oh, sure I don't that disagree is with that. I'm just reasons. saying this is what is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that is one of the reasons they did it. But is this also uh, Walker Studio taking steps to try and do away with the concept of mega tribes and the vast amount of resources they have at their disposal? Why would they care? Because mega tribes kind of ruin the game. Well, then they should have tur- then they should turn off Cross Arc. <laughs> uh, that's the way to fix Mega Tribe. It's the only way to fix Mega Tribe. Well, maybe not the only way because now uh, Mega Tribes have a limit to how many platform cells they can have in their tribe and how many teams they can have in a tribe. Well, I mean, if you look at some of the uh, major Mega Tribe battles, when they're going in tanking with Bronos, I mean, how many Bronos are they going in with? 10, 20? 10, 20, but they've got 100 back in the main base. Ready to be brought in. On a different server. On a different server, but still, it's not that big of a problem for them to bring them in because you got tech transmitters now. You know, this makes it harder for uh, Mega Traps to have that buffer where they have hundreds of backup downs for their fights now. Well, I think it just means that they can't have platforms ready to go on all of them. They can't have platforms on their vaults. Mm-hmm. But once again, platforms count as 19 tribe team slots. So, yeah, while they can keep them in their vault, there's still the, the dino limit that's being implemented. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how the uh, meta I, changes I, in the I vaults. have this weird... I mean, I can't really point to any specific objections overall, like this, but somehow, I don't know, it's it just triggering my anti... Uh, my, my uh, that was heavy-handed sense. Mm-hmm. If, if platform sales are... I mean, it's very obvious they're definitely server, trying to specifically do something. Yeah. I mean, if, I mean, if they're looking at the metrics and they're saying, hey... Platform cells are taking up like 80% of our CPU cycles, and we got other survivors trying to roll around and do things. Right. And, the, the, and most of the platform cells, let's be honest, are just sitting on the back of dinos, not moving. I mean, that might be a problem. I mean, maybe this is just their way of trying to uh, cull the platform dinos. Uh, ultimately, costing. you know, as long as we don't have the ability to put any weaponry on a, uh, you know, any non manned weaponry on a uh, platform saddle, though, I mean, ultimately you're not really going to see them with anything more than that little box, so... I don't know. I, I, there was a really smart Redditor who suggested that they might return auto guns. Yeah. It was a post <laughs> I think we saw earlier. I don't know. Uh, I've heard that so many times before. I wouldn't really say it's a very uh, original observation. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so let me go back to it, this, the, the Mega Tribe thing, because I'm really hung up on this. And I do think uh, Wildcard Studio is looking to do away with Mega Tribes because you, you have all these smaller tribes, as we were talking about earlier when it came to Dupin. Well, the reason for Dupin is that, well, we can't take on a Mega Tribe because you got all this stuff. And we don't want to be, well, so I'm adding this in. We don't want to be a man and go out with a blaze of glory or fight to the death. We got to cheat to win. I mean, if we had that. I stand attitude, by my statement. If you want to fix the Mega Tribe problem, just turn off Cross Arc. But Cross Arc Problem keeps... solved. See, I, I don't think that's going to fix the issue because that, that kind of hurts the game itself because Cross Arc is, you know, a part of the game now. And it's really... Yeah, well, no, all you're going to do at best is slow them down, is slow the, uh, is slow them down a little. Now they're now you're going to increase the likelihood of seeing server lockouts as a tactic and uh, all kinds of other mean, nasty, very, just very not nice tactics. I mean, mm-hmm. personally, I think they're busy enough just trying to fix issues than to have to deal with, like, hey, let's reshape the political landscape of ARC with game mechanics. Like, uh, I, I, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like, I, I just don't think they're the type to get into it. Uh, maybe not. I, like I said, I could be reading a lot into this, but I do think that uh, it would behoove Wildcard Studios to do away with the Mega Tribes. And even though Mega Tribes could easily get around this by breaking their tribes into smaller tribes all allied and all that well that means you've got multiple tribes having to do the multiple same tasks for multiple dinos making it even more grindier for a mega tribe that's had to break itself down if it wanted to have hundreds and hundreds of dinos and a hundred platform dinos ready to rock and roll well at the risk of opening a pandora's box here and revisiting an old topic Mm -hmm. what's the definition of a mega tribe at this point like how do they define that how do they define a mega? How does Wildcard define a mega tribe, and how do they define it as something that needs to be yeah, torn down? That's true. I mean, what what's the number cutoff we would consider? Fifty players, active players, to be a mega tribe? 
on multiple servers or one server? I, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't we know. never really came up. I always treated Mega Tribe as like being an alpha. It, it's more a matter of what uh, of what you're doing than anything else. See, alpha tribes I consider to essentially be a small tribe of 25, 30, maybe 40 players active, controlling one server or maybe two or three servers. A mega tribe is those with 50 plus players with five servers, four or five servers or more than that. I mean, we, we know we've come across mega tribes where they boast 200 active players, and it's like, Yikes! Yeah, that uh, uh, that's always crazy when you realize that, that those kind of things exist. Yep. So yeah, I mean, once again, I could be reading too much into this. I'd like to know what everybody else thinks as well, and whether or not mega tribes need to go, or at least be hindered in such a way that they're not as has can have as much of an impact as they have prior to now. No, it's. It'd be nice to be able to have tribes fight on in even on even terms for the most part and have to rely on tactics and strategy. That's always been my thing. You know, tactics and strategies will, will win the day and sheer yeah. stubbornness, too. It's hard to do that, though, without limiting player freedom. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a good point. It's a, it's a tough balance to make and do. And, uh, yeah, so let's go back to the third person which is now on PvP's official servers. Um, is this something that should have been just for PvE and not for, for PvP? So, I haven't had enough experience with it to say if it really affects gameplay one way or the other. Generally, when I play, I still play in first person. I don't know if that's just my bias to have, after having played the game for as long as I have. Mm-hmm. But I don't really think it's going to change things as much as people think it's going to change things. See, like I said, it, it gives a tactical advantage to the person who uses third person over the first person user because you're more person, aware of your surroundings. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, the, your field of view is infinitely better than somebody in first person mode. I mean, you're able to watch and make sure nobody comes up behind you and clubs you out now. And I just have a strange feeling that, that, you, was, that, that the fact is, by the time they moved into, cam- uh, into camera angle, it might not make a difference at that point. They might already be too close. I mean, I was going to say, most mm-hmm. of the times when I'm dying to something, especially while dinos, I'm just running in one direction and then hearing the hit noise. <laughs> you know, at least this time I can actually see what's biting me. Yeah. So what I liked about orbital camera is that you couldn't really fight when you're in orbital camera. But now, you, And so if you wanted to see your surroundings, you had to sacrifice being able to really react to anything when you're in orbital mode or the K mode. Now you no longer have that problem because you've got third person and you can fight in third person. Now that's a huge change. And I'm really not liking the concept of this. So have you actually fought anybody in third person? No, not re- not yet. But I, I know that I'll have a huge advantage over somebody in first person if I'm using third person. It's just, that's yeah. how it is. And I've always stayed away from third person shooter games because I just hate fighting in third person. It's not fun. No, I can look around it's a awkward. corner without risking my avatar. It's like, well, where's the fun in that? Can you imagine playing a game like Counter Strike in third person? Yeah. Ugh. It was called SOCOM. It was really popular. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. A lot of big changes. I play a sure. lot of third person and a lot of first person games, so you know, I'm used mm-hmm. to the. Di- I'm used to both. <laughs> I just remember in, I just had the, the something popped through my head though uh, back in Morrowind where you could very much tell that the third person animations were an afterthought <laughs> the feet never quite touched the ground properly yeah <laughs> I'll say this if I'm in first person and I cannot look down and see my character's body it bothers me so much more than third person ever does yeah <laughs> so does it bother you that when you're holding your gun in front of your face that it's not like, you know, your your eyeballs effectively at chest level? Yes, actually, I'm constantly irritated by that kind of thing, but I just learned to live <laughs> with it. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's pretty much it for the patch notes and for the main topic. Uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about, player numbers for the game. So at its peak, which was back in February of this year, they you know there were 100,000 players. And it averaged around 53,000 players a day. That's uh, what it was in February. 
since then there there's been a, a noticeable decline in March that went down to forty one thousand April forty two thousand uh may dropped down to thirty seven thousand average players and then went back up to forty seven thousand but in July dropped down to forty one thousand average players and now in the last thirty days thirty five thousand players are still playing arc survival evolved with a peak of fifty five thousand at times so, so to white knight a little bit for wild card, I still think those numbers are absolutely freaking amazing for oh, as old as this game yeah. is but it's no longer in the top ten play games. I Steam. it dropped. blame well, so I blame Wildcard for the PR disaster that's this legacy server announcement. Mm-hmm. If they had just say it, so honestly, if they just stayed quiet about it, you know, the community would have been like up in arms. They'd be like, "What are you gonna do, Wildcard? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna do this? Are you gonna do that?" And there would have been all kinds of rage posts on Reddit. But I don't think the population damage would have been as severe if they yeah. had just stayed quiet wow. about it. Maybe until a week before it happened. Because what I'm seeing again and again, even watching the major Twitch streams, is people are saying like, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're all planning to, to get back into the game when the new servers launch, but in the meantime, why bother farming on the old servers? Why bother doing anything on the old servers if I'm planning to go to the new servers? Mm-hmm. I don't want that investment. Yeah. And uh, I think that's where the tactical mistake was made. Yeah, I mean, it's been on the fringe of the top 10. Um, currently, it sits at 11. Earlier today, it was at 13, and I think this morning, 15th. So it's in the top 20 still, but, you know, being in the top 10 keeps it in the eye more. I more mean, it's more. very respectable, but, I, again, I think the population issues that are going on in the last couple of weeks are self-inflicted. Yeah, especially because of the new servers and the legacy servers, and yada, yada, yada. And um, I, we were talking about this before we started recording, where my, at least my personal opinion is going to be that the new servers and the legacy servers will be opened up to each other within, or, you know, in about six months after launch. Yep. I'd be surprised if it takes them that long. Yeah, I sense. actually had somebody uh, talking to me earlier today saying that they heard it would be three months hmm. is when they will open up the servers to each other. Inside info or just speculation? Um, They said it was inside information, but didn't sound that convincing. I mean, that, intuitively, that sounds about right. Mm-hmm. I don't know, I think three months would be well, too soon. Well, remember how quickly, how they surprised us with how quickly they opened up uh, Scorched. Yeah, how long ago, how quickly was it when the game, was it a two months? It went from us being able, I mean, when it first came out, we could transfer stuff off Scorched all we wanted to, but, you know. Just the players. But and then, then just out of nowhere, we just could start transferring fully back and forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't remember. And then was everything got months? real crazy for a while. Uh, yeah, I want to say two or three months. So, yeah, maybe there is something to the three-month theory that they'll open up uh, transfers between new and legacy servers. But, you know, then if people are thinking this, it would behoove the tribes on the legacy servers to stay in the legacy servers and keep working on their uh, bloodlines and bases because they've got a huge advantage right now. I think a lot of those bloodlines are going to be stolen by smaller tribes. <laughs> Time for me to start looking for uh, those nice middle bases that have run down. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously Wah-ha-ha-ha. a decline in players. <laughs> yeah, decline in players, not surprising. Still pretty good. I mean, a lot of games wish they had that, that many people playing their games right now. Yeah, Arcs had a really great run. Oh, yeah. It, it's I too mean, bad that they their monetization strategy, though, involves upfront purchases you know i really yeah. wish there was a way to continually fund the development of this game beyond just initial purchase mm-hmm. i just find it weird that football manager 2017 is ahead of arc survival ball when it comes to player counts that's just yeah, so that weird. amazing really yeah that's hysterical and it's in the top 10 it's actually in 10th place right now uh, so here's the top 10 from 1 to 10. Dota 2, obviously. Then Player Unknown's Battleground is pushed ahead of uh, Counter-Strike, which is now in third place. H1Z1, Grand Theft Auto 5, Team Fortress 2, Path of Exile, surprisingly, is in there. Warframe, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege, Football Manager, and then Ark Survival Evolved. And after that is Payday 2, Civ- uh, Civilization 5. Hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. But uh, Russ, they're down to a pithy 13,000 as I'm looking at it right now, but it's 1.30 in the morning Eastern Standard Time on a Wednesday. We started recording this a little late. Well, I'm proud of Path of Exile. Yeah. Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Is, no, uh... I mean, look at some of the competitors to Arc 2. Like, yeah. um, 
Conan and Dark and Light. Those games are really doing good, but they're still not on the same level. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Where is? Let me see if Conan's even on the top 100. I think. I mean, Conan's got about. It is, but it only has 4,500 players on right now. 45. Yeah. Well, I mean, to be to to me, I'm still impressed by that. That's still relatively good considering Mm -hmm. the genre. Dark and Light has 3,300 players on right now. Yeah. No, I think eventually we'll. I might do something of a try and do some kind of analysis between the three types of games and see how they're doing. Black Desert Online. What is that? Is that another? That's a sandbox as well, right? Yep. Uh, I think it's a MM, MMO RPG. Yeah, they have twelve thousand. They're in the top twenty. Hmm. Yeah, good for them. Yeah, it's not even a new game. It isn't. It's rather old. Yeah. So I think we're gonna finally cut it there. And uh, once again, I want to hear back from the player, uh, from our listeners out there regarding Mega Tribes. And my question is: Is Studio Wildcard focusing on reducing the effects or the sizes of Mega Tribes? Curious to hear what you guys have to say. Because it is time to close out episode fifty-four of the Archaeologist Podcast. Thank you to our participants this week, and thank you for listening to us on YouTube. If you have enjoyed this week's episode, feel free to like and share this video, and subscribe to the channel. You can also leave comments or questions for us in the comment section below. Goodbye and stay alive, survivors.